Well, hello everyone and welcome back to the podcast. We're up to episode number 11. It's my final episode for season one and uh, what a journey it's been. Uh, it's been great to have so many listeners on board and uh, to round out this wonderful year of some great guests that we've had on board, I'm stepping offshore to Europe and the United States. I'd like to introduce you to the wonderful Andrea Ozart. Now, if I pronounce your surname correctly. <laughs> Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you, David. Uh, I pronounce it Oswald, Andrea Oswald. Awesome, awesome. I have a habit of pronouncing uh, surnames uh, wrong on the podcast, so that's great that I've got yours um, correct. So, welcome, Andrea, and and thanks for being my first European guest to be on the Late Bloomer Actor. Oh, am I? Oh, wonderful. So, congratulations to you for your first uh, season. Wonderful. Thank you, thank you. My very first guest was an Australian, but and she was in New York at the time. So, but you're my first uh, overseas person who actually calls overseas home. So that's wonderful. Yeah, thank I, you. <laughs> where are you? Where are you based at the moment? I know you go between um, Europe and the states. So, where are you calling in from today? I am based in Budapest now. I used to live in the States for years, but uh, I came back because I missed Europe and I missed home and family and friends. And uh, I'm very happy to be back. Fair enough. Fair enough. And I see that you still have um, agents in both in Berlin, Budapest, Italy and LA. So you truly are remaining an international actress then? Yeah, we can say so. Yes. Me and my agent, um, my German agent, have been working together for 16 years, 17 years. And I wow. think it's one of my biggest achievements because uh, it's not the same in Italy or, or in America because, you know, as we grow as actors, we sometimes have to say goodbye to people because we just outgrow mm -hmm. them. But it wasn't the case with my um, international agent. My German agent actually is my worldwide agent now, I can say, because we were growing together. Awesome. Awesome. Now, I'd really like to talk about your career, and I'm, I'm looking at doing two aspects. So firstly, your journey as an actress, um, which continues very successfully today, as we've um, just started talking about. And secondly, your, your coaching field, which you're stepping into now, uh, where you, you're inspiring other actors with mentorship and um, skills that you've learned along the way of your journey. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But before we dive into all that, can we get you to tell us about your life growing up, uh, where you grew up and, and what led you to the world of acting and, and your journey so far? Yeah, thank you for asking. You know, I grew up in Hungary, which is a small country in Central Europe next to Austria. Um, but it was part of the so-called Eastern Bloc. That's how mm -hmm. people refer to it, um, because we are actually neighbors with Ukraine and Romania. So um, there wasn't much to do in the, in the 80s in Hungary when it was still communism. And I grew up in a small Hungarian uh, countryside village. And uh, I remember I used to be envious of my cousins who lived in the capital city because they could attend ballet, dance school, uh, I don't know, tennis, uh, skating, whatever lessons they, they could. And there was just nothing in the countryside where I grew up. So I mm. sort of um, made a promise to myself that I would make it up for myself in the future as an adult. And I think that desire and that aspiration kept me going really far because I eventually made it to Hollywood. And this was not a very realistic dream as a six years old or as a teenager in the Hungarian countryside. Mm. But I have a very determined personality and, um, um, you know, I, I first left when I was like 18 years old. I, I started to wow. work as a model abroad and I started to travel and, and I moved first to Italy uh, when I was 24 and I lived there for 10 years. So I, I sometimes refer to it as if it was elementary school was Hungary. High school was Italy, and then I went to university um, in, L in L.A., in Hollywood. So uh, I had this progress of my career pretty lined up. Wow. And, uh, so growing up where you were, English was not your first language, was it? No, no. We no. speak Hungarian here. Um, but thank you for pointing out because it's, it takes work 
to speak like this. I mean, I mm. every day I practice and I read out loud in English just to keep keep my language skills. So even after all these years, you still got to you still have to do that to maintain it. Yes, because it's very mm. easy to forget and get out of practice and get out of habits. So 10 minutes a day, uh, I try to either speak to someone or read out loud or uh, listen to audiobooks, for example. Wow. I just find that amazing because you've learned a whole language and then become an actress with that language. Whereas I speak English, but I'm trying to, uh, to, get it, to make it to Hollywood or in American productions. I need to learn an American accent and I struggle just to learn an accent to get away from this um, Australian accent, which I'm hoping you're understanding fine. <laughs> I am, I am. Thank you. Uh, I hope it's not such an effort for you to speak this way, but I completely clearly understand you. And thank you for bringing this topic up because it's a huge topic. I was also told um, early at, at, at an early stage of my career that I should lose my European accent. You know, and people can hear uh, different opinions about mm -hmm. this, but um, I think it's um, actually acting in a foreign language. It's a big topic. I also wrote a, a blog post about this because I don't, I not, not only act in English, but also in Italian and German. And what Wonderful. I found out is that I feel more free when I act in a foreign language because when I act in front of people who know it's not my mother tongue, I feel they're more forgiving and they overlook certain little mistakes maybe. So that gives me a mindset of um, I don't have to be perfect, oh, which I should be perfect in, in my mother tongue. And maybe, maybe even you, when you mm. act in English, you feel like you have to pronounce everything perfect and you have to do the intonation perfect and everything mm. just perfect otherwise the audience will go Ooh. but if you act in a foreign language then then you have the freedom of making mistakes wow wow oh, that's, in that's very interesting mm. but you know and, and like you said a lot of people have, have encouraged you to lose your accent but um you know when you speak english and when you're using your ac your accent not being american or another another country that's who you are um and i know a lot of productions are now going away um, there's a lot of talk about saying we don't want actors who are putting on an accent anymore we want actors who are themselves you know so if they want a texan they want a texan i don't know if that's oh, changing but i'm hearing a lot about it <laughs> i hope so i hope so and i agree because it's it's uh it's a completely wrong um a way to to approach this business to if you have to change who you are because mm. then on a, on a long run on, in long term that will have side effects on your persona on your personality because you can literally sort of lose yourself and not knowing anymore who you really are so mm. if i have to act like as if i was an american i mean maybe i can try and have fun to do that but in the long run um, I lived in America, so I know I wasn't, I wasn't feeling, I didn't feel belonging there. That's not where I belong. So it's mm. a sense of belonging and your identity that you have to keep to stand out. Otherwise, you just become a, a copy of someone else. Fair enough. And that's, Fair enough. Not, and, and, that's not interesting. And a lot of it's about culture, isn't it? I mean, uh, you need to know and be the culture to change. But so... Obviously, if you were to go to England and, and, and play an actress in a period piece, you need to you need to learn the accent and play that accent. But if you're going to England and playing a modern day uh, crime show, there's no right. reason why you can't be uh, a European living in England who's who's now the detective or the or the criminal or anything like that. And I think a lot of the productions are now changing that and reaching out and saying we've got a diversity in casting. We can have a diversity in cultures and diversity in backgrounds. It doesn't have to be an American police officer. It can be an Australian police officer who now lives in America. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, great, great um, way to put it. And I agree and I'm happy to hear that. Of course, I, w I wouldn't be able to play probably Shakespeare uh, in a British theatre because mm. that would just not be me. And it would take an, an incredible amount of effort for me to, to speak with like British English and 
and that old ancient language mm. that I don't really know. Well, Shakespeare is very, very special, and I've never had any background in training in Shakespeare either. So just the little bits I've had, I'm going to be scary to even think about it. So, um, <laughs> I just want to quickly touch on um, your early days in your acting career as a new actress. Um, so you were a, a model for quite a few years, did a lot of commercials, and then you were fortunate, I believe, to um, get a role, a small role on um, Spy Game in 2001, alongside the wonderful Robert Redford and Brad Pitt. How yes, was that exactly. as an experience as a young actress? Quite a start, right? Oh, awesome. So, yeah, I was, I was cast in this wonderful evergreen movie, Spy Game, because it was partly shot in Budapest. And I played the niece of Robert Redford in it. And um, this set me up for, for acting, for my acting life. Mm. And, um, you know, Tony Scott, the director, already passed away, but... When I was living in LA, I had a chance and I bumped into him accidentally in a restaurant once and uh, oh, wow. I sort of blamed him and I told him, it's your fault. You don't remember me, but you cast me like 15 years before in this movie in Hungary and you made me believe that I was worthy enough and it was um, that I it was worth to take the risk and try to become an actress or a screen actress or a Hollywood actress, because you made me believe that you cast me and and made me feel like I'm worthy and I'm talented enough to play opposite Robert Redford and Brad Pitt. So it was a huge experience. And of course, then after I got other smaller productions, even flops. So it the roller coaster started exactly, high, yeah. but eventually, yes, it's it's ups and downs cool and so when you started your acting journey in uh, hungary uh I've, I've read that you you said that it was a difficult journey um both uh you had a family not supporting you're more concerned of, that you were trying to go down a path that in in your country wasn't a very available option and you did a you did a lot of small courses because that's all you had available to so what acting training have you had over over all these years or is it pretty much real world on set. I could call myself also a late bloomer because awesome. um, in Hungary, the drama school, the official state uh, university, we call it for drama, um, you can only uh, apply until you're 21 years old, I think. Wow. Yes, it's quite strict. It's maybe mm. the communist uh, mentality, but it's still like this because... Okay. I was told that teachers believe that um, when when you do, don't have your personality just ready yet, it's they're still able to work with you and um, form you and shape you, and that's what they want. But um, above that age, you already have a strong personality, so mm. it's more difficult to to shape you and um, make you a good actor, which I don't agree with. So I was I realized quite late that I wanted to become an actor and um, the university wasn't an option for me because I moved from the countryside to the capital and I had to make a living and I had to work. Mm. And in Hungary, if you are in doing the university for arts, you're not allowed to work for four years wow. because they, they say you're not ready. You're not ready yet. So I did a one year um, long acting uh, workshop uh, a course, and then I moved to Italy. I did another other year there in um, in a school called oops, in a school called um, International Acting School. Okay, wow. And um, so I always sort of lean on this for when I'm asking either industry guests or fellow actors or fellow late bloomers. Let's go. We, we can call each other a late bloomer. Um, so most of us, when we, we do start out, like we haven't had a chance to go to those drama schools and we learn with those small courses. So do you see the benefits of older actors bringing to them that life experience? And, and you've already said that your, um, you know, the, the universities where you weren't allowed to go unless you were 21 or under because they wanted to mold you. And does that make you an actor if you don't have any life experience? So do you see the difference in the younger actors who have been in it, at it for a while compared to an actor who's just bringing life experience only? Hmm. Good question. Um, I feel there is more character in late bloomers, 
because they have they have actually something to say and uh, they they have something to con contribute with mm. while young actors are so inexperienced and shy sometimes and insecure that um, that can be a barrier of um, expressing themselves properly and I really like to work with actors who are not professionally trained because uh, they bring they bring a sense of life to to the work mm. I, I, I do find that I mean it's not it's not rubbishing young actors a, a, a call of, of course because they will obviously learn that over time and they'll get that life experience. And I've had a previous guest on here who, um, who went through one of the drama schools here in Australia. And he says, everyone, it's getting younger and younger and younger in Australia now. And they're punching out the, you know, the young, beautiful um, actors and actresses, you know, the ripped abs and stuff. We've got a show here called Home and Away. So they're all young actors and beautiful and pretty people. So whereas if we watch the streaming TV shows now, the characters are changing and we're seeing older actors and people with life experience and injuries and uh, sunburnt hair scars. and re yeah. scars and wrinkles. And that makes, wrinkles. Exactly. It makes such a character, doesn't it? Because I mean, beautiful people are beautiful people. And, 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 and that's what life has both sides, but TV can't be yeah. one type of person, can it? It's got to be everybody. I know, but it's, uh, it's also such an interesting thing topic because you know I used to be a model so I guess mm. I used to be considered as beautiful and uh, and attractive so I was cast at the beginning of my career also for my appearance and my looks so uh, and I really had to fight fight hard uh, against this belief that I'm only just a body and I'm only just a pretty face and there's nothing in it and there's nothing behind mm. so of course, I didn't have life experience, but I, I knew I had personality, I had determination and my thoughts, but still this face and body was somehow playing a part in um, obstaculate, obstaculating me, like um, mm. being sometimes working against me because um, I wanted more complicated parts deeper parts, more meaningful parts, not just to play the chick, uh, you know, next to someone. So it's always, I, I'm always careful when talking about beautiful people getting into acting because, because beautiful people are also just as valid and they should not be judged and labeled just because they're beautiful. Mm. And I mean, and, and beauty is two things, is both physical and, and inner as well, isn't it? Now we're getting yeah. really deep, of course. But um, so if you've got the, the, the right personality and, the, and you treat people the right way, that's, that's half the journey really to, to being a, a great actor. Yeah, yeah, mm. absolutely. And now uh, that sort of leans a little bit to um, uh, your journey come up. You've, you've, um, you've got a few blog posts that you talk about some of the difficulties that you had in getting your acting career going. And I've got a, a quote from you here that you say, but I didn't give up. Instead of listening to all the discouraging voices, I shut my mouth and rolled up my sleeves and I changed my method. Um, I absolutely oh, love that. Oh, you read my ebook. <laughs> I've read you some read of it. You read my ebook. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for I, I love it. It's it's interesting because I've just listened to um, uh, some motivational stuff from Arnold Schwarzenegger, who's you know a, a similar journey out of Austria. You know, he didn't want to stay there and become a farmer and and do what his family expected. So he he moved to America because he had a dream, and he persevered. And he said a lot of things like he was told that he can't. Um, uh, or it's impossible and he said well no I can and it's possible and I think that's what you were leaning towards is what yeah, your journey's done. I, I already realized when someone tells you you can't it means they can't so never listen to even if it's told by your mom or your spouse or your friends that you cannot because it just means they cannot mm. so it's a game of you know mindset and uh, where thank you for bringing up my ebook because uh, if you go on my website, then you can download this ebook for free. And I tried to summarize a little bit of my principles 
um, according to which I built up my career, which is nearly 25 years long. And I started to help actors because I got approached by a lot of actors about for advice. And, um, and I'm trying to uh, put it into words. And mm -hmm. uh, apparently it's helping others. And it also helped me to understand and become conscious about how I work as a person and what uh, served me and what didn't serve me. So um, there, these are quite universal principles, but mm. um, especially in acting, um, I, I wrote this ebook uh, for actors and entertainment workers that uh, what these principles need to uh, or have to do with uh, in the entertainment world. That's awesome. And, and, and a lot of this will lead into, we'll talk about your coaching in a moment. And obviously the reason why you've got into coaching and, and writing your blog and your ebook is because of hurdles that you faced in your journey, um, hurdles that you've had to jump over. What advice can you give listeners so that they can start thinking about those hurdles and when they're presented with them? Um, because you talk a lot about mental health for actors, um, uh, you know, such as one issue being the desire uh, to belong, as well as the competition actors are facing. So all these things are the, are the little hurdles that are thrown at us every day. What advice do you have to actors to push through those moments? Yes, every day is different. And also me, um, I'm different every day. Uh, I, have, I can have good days and bad days as well. So um, the most difficult times for actors are, I think, when they are in transition and transitioning in, in between jobs. A lot of downtime, downtime, and um, I think it helps if you if you know why you're doing this. It's such a simple question, mm. but it's very difficult to answer. So you have to be clear about what you do and why you do it. And if you're clear about that, um, and this is what I'm helping other actors with to understand themselves. Um, if they want a guest starring role or a principal role, I, I, I usually like to go deeper and ask them what a guest starring role means to them and what they think it will bring to them that they're lacking and they're missing in their lives. So what does that role represent and, and what they were aspiring for when they were little, like when I was six years old and, um, I didn't have the means to to go to um, drama school or any uh, participate in any um, art uh, activity. I made this promise to myself that I would make it up to myself, and I would also help my mother and and um, relieve my mother from this weight of you know not having money and. Mm. Um, and not being able to to pay for these kind of luxury things like a music lesson, for example. Wow. Mm. So I had this drive in me, and uh, and when I think about my young self, my inner child, it it always helps me to pull myself out of these uh, unlucky or unfortunate moments when I'm out of work or when I'm when I I'm insecure. And we all have those moments. I, I've I've spoken about it numerous times about the roller coaster, the ups and downs. And when when you're up, you're just elated and you're, you're loving the journey. But then when you have those down moments, you question everything about yourself, don't you? Yes, because you the world makes you feel like they don't need you. You're mm. you're not wanted. Nobody's missing you. You're not worthy enough. They've forgotten about you. Uh, maybe you're not talented. You never know if you go, if you ever gonna book a job again. It's mm. so uh, this this profession is is full of uncertainties and it is a roller coaster. And no wonder why so many actors leave entertainment and give up because it's so much out of our control. But there are ways to keep your sanity, your mental health, and um, and find ways, like coping mechanisms and uh, strategic thinking, that will help you not only keep your mental health, 
but also to chat to be able to channel these negative experiences into into your art into your mm. roles and uh, and they can teach you also how to be patient and how to trust the process and trust yourself your instinct that I do want to do this. I know I, I can do this and I was born to do this. And the affirmation and reaffirmation will make, will make it happen because it will manifest. Mm. Mm. And you, you were saying a lot of the times, especially about going through those moments when you don't have work, do you believe actors should have their safety job, like a job that's not acting that they can do when they're not acting? Or do you believe actors, so if you want to be an actor, you should be full-time actor? I mean, obviously you have to eat, so you need to find a way to, to my, make ends meet. My theory, yeah, my theory is that in the first 15 years of your career, you have to push it. You have to push mm. it hard and focus on acting only because it requires a lot of energy and focus. And there's so much to learn and to be trained. You have to watch all the movies that are out there and know everybody in your field, in your on your market. So in your first 15 years, you are making and building the foundation for your life career. So um, I would insist that you try everything um, not to become a waiter. And, um, but of course, every situation is different and of every course, of course. circumstance is different. So it's very hard to, it's easy to say, but it's hard to do. But then later on, when you realize that you are not only an actor, you're also a person and a human being and a neighbor or a father or a mother or whatever you are, other identities in life, it's, I think it's helpful to have um, side hustle, or I don't know how how I they like call it, or, or yeah, or a job that, or mm. maybe even if you do just charity on a regular basis, mm. that will give you something to do and something meaningful that will give you back your sense of self. Mm. Yeah, I've uh, I've had a uh, casting director who talked about your plan B. So your plan A is your acting career, which you need to put all the focus on. And making sure that you you're doing as much as you can professionally, and uh, and meeting goals and and the business side of acting, which I'll, I'll ask you a moment about. But having that plan B, that fallback uh, about raising money, um, whether that's you're, you're fortunate to have a, a, a trust fund in the background or some sort of career in the background. See, my journey is I, I'm a full time public servant, so I started an actor later on. So I've decided I want to be an actor, but I. I have to keep my main job until I'm ready to retire. So I make it work and I treat it professionally. Yeah. So I think that's the big thing for people is to, hey, if you can become a full-time actor, go and do it and do it 100%. If you can't be an actor 100% of the time, be 100% on your efforts all the time. Yeah, but agree? I would, yeah, but uh, it's such an interesting question. Who is a full-time actor? I don't mm. know if there is, any full-time actor at all because if i think of you know robert redford or brad pitt the two that we already talked about um they're not full-time actors either they do other things as well so yeah, it's just an mm. image and just a perception what we have of others that we think it's true it's our fantasy but it's not the reality not necessarily the reality so being a full-time actor is maybe someone who's doing theater every day and rehearsing every day, but that's very rare. And um, particularly I'm a screen actor, so I'm not playing in theaters. So I was never a full-time actor. My career is 25 years long and I have like 40, 50 film credits, but, but I am still today not a full-time actor. In this moment, I'm not shooting anything. Mm. Of course, I just got a casting call and I'm in talks for a project. But in this very particular moment and day, I am not hired. So mm. am I a full time actor? I'm not hired. Mm. So these are also like the principles and the words that we might want to replace in our heads because they're not helping us and they're not serving us. That 
you know, we want to aspire to be full-time actors, why there is no such thing as full-time actors. Fair enough. But you know, you when you're not on set, you're running your coaching, so you're you're passing on your knowledge and your skills to other people. Uh, now, yeah. obviously, that may or may not involve an income as well, but it's it's meeting both ends. It's you're helping other people out. So um, that brings us around to uh, we were leaning towards it before about the business side of acting, regardless of of your journey. So you talk about in your coaching. Um, uh, you, to bring actors forward to become international actors or to actors wherever they want to be. Um, you teach and you coach in areas ranging from the basics, which is obviously very, very necessary, marketing and self-management, uh, representation, communication, and maybe uh, maybe the most important, uh, work-life balance. Now, obviously, these would all be way out of scope of the podcast. We could talk for hours about them, but can you elaborate a little on, on one of these or, or just a, a general oversight, what you mm -hmm. what you teach as a coach and what you think actors can take from that whole area? Yeah. Um, I think what I teach is is not has not been taught yet. I mean I haven't found it anywhere else. I've read a few books, very few books and very few literature exists about performers psychology. And um, acting schools teach the craft of acting, mm -hmm. which is which is like a full time job to learn how to act properly, technically. But what they don't teach is um, is how to be prepared for for the setbacks, for the ups and downs, for the unforeseen events, for the competition that you are about to face. And for that, uh, one needs to have the, um, the fundamentals uh, in themselves. So what I really like and I like the most in this is that um, finding out what drives people to, to become actors and, um, and how to keep their motivation even if the work dries up and um, there's not much to do. So um these are things that are outside of acting mm. but they have a lot to do with how to function and how to build success and lasting success in film mm. and it's, a lot of it's not just for actors either isn't it it's about developing a resilience to to life because life can throw right. you so much um and how do you think actors need to address the negative side of the industry. There are some big negatives and, uh, you know, we've had things happen in the world now where actors have been taken advantage of. Um, what's the best way for actors to know that they're not being taken advantage of or they're not being put down? You know, what can we learn from that, you think? Yes, I've had my own experiences as well and I've seen other actors going down roads that um, I just find tragic. Mm. So... It would be just high time in, for the industry to pay more attention to the mental health of industry workers. And um, there are symptoms. I also experienced some of the symptoms. Uh, I also read, uh, wrote a chapter about this in, a, in another publishing. Uh, there is a book called Transforming Your Life that you can find mm -hmm. on Amazon. And I wrote a chapter about this um, that kind of sort of like Hollywood made me almost like losing my sanity because it was just dehumanizing. It's a system that dehumanizes people, not only actors. So once you feel on yourself these symptoms of being on edge or grumpy or irritated all the time, it's a sign. It's a sign that your nervous system is not, you cannot deal with this probably any mm. longer. And, uh, you know, extremely long shooting schedules and so on and so on. So the best thing that people can do in this case is, of course, to talk to someone, like really. There are hotlines in Australia, in America. There are not so many in Europe yet, but what I would advise for everybody, and it's quite easy to do, is to go on a trip. And by going far and get distant from that place where you have this 
you produce these symptoms, you you are changing perspective, and you're gonna you are you're gonna be able to look at the problem from an outside point of view, and it will be the even the problem will become distant. Right. So I yeah. so I I I, I uh, often use this technique for myself that I sit on a plane and I just went somewhere and that prevented me from going back to the problem and mm. it was a self-help mechanism of you know physically getting distant from the place where I was not feeling right and that helped me not only physically but even mentally mm. and I think a, a lot of actors can fall into the trap of of wanting the fame and the fortune or, or to to become that actor so much that they will listen to anybody. And that's what has been the past problems, isn't it? That, And we're finding ways now to stop people taking advantage of actors in that way. And a lot of the unions now around the world um, have those support services there. So that if you think you're in, the, in a bad place, that you've got somewhere to ring up and, and the support agencies to help you out. So I think it's a great thing that it's changing around the world. Hopefully, yes. And uh, as I said in the beginning of my career, and as I wrote it in the ebook, I stopped listening to the discouraging voices. But you also have to filter out the flattering voices that are not honest and not real. Because sometimes people hype you because mm. you're new or you're, you know, just the um, the actual star of the moment, but they don't really necessarily care about you as a person. They care about you as a product that can bring them success or money or fame. Mm. So they they like this stardust around you. But then when you don't deliver or change or out of work, these people disappear, and um, and then you can feel feel really lonely. So mm. you have to be able also to to deal with, um, sorry to say, the bullshit of this business. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> there's, there's so plenty much, of that there. Mm. <laughs> there's so much. And uh, there's a famous phrase that I like to quote from Sam Spiegel, a Hollywood producer, um, that says, actors, um, how does it go? Um, the problem starts when actors start to believe in their own publicity. Wow. Because sometimes we actors see ourselves on ourselves on billboards, on the cover of magazines, on television. Uh, we are followed by fans and photographers and paparazzi. And then we believe that we are entitled or different or superior to someone mm. or others. But it's not. It's no. just, it's artificial. It's, you are made a star by other people. So they can make you a star, but they can also make you a beggar. Mm. Like, it's, it's really, you, you, you also have to learn how to handle stardom and fame and social media being targeted. This is also part of my program that I teach. Of course, not so, not to all of the actors, but only those who get to this point mm. and, I, and i suppose it means don't letting your ego become something that it's not isn't it i i was on uh way back in the 90s i did uh, extra work in sydney and i was on set with guy pierce for a movie called dating the enemy and we, we were on a break and everyone was having their meals and typical movie set your your crew and your your leading stars all go first for food and all the extras line up last so we were doing the right thing guy pierce was um on a phone call on his mobile, chatting away, and everyone else had eaten, and so we were all lined up. He finished his phone call, and he came over to join the crew, and so we've sort of made a gap to let him go at the front because he's the star of the show. And he says, no, no, you guys were all here first, and he joined the back of the line. So that's his ego not writing checks, yeah. as they said in the movie. That's that's what I was talking mm. about, yeah. And I love it, and I think that makes that makes a great star. When you get someone that's at the top, and they're like that, that's what I aspire to be as an actor. So. Exactly. So, mm. so hopefully he is um, a, gra a good example for someone who knows his place and he kept his mental sanity. Probably he has right support like family or friends mm. and a support system around himself, which is very important that you have someone who holds your hand, even cool. when you are 
out of work. And I was going to ask, so you talked a lot about it before, but um, so it's about having the right team behind you, both whether that's your family uh, or your agents and your managers. So having that team there that you know that when the work isn't there, they're still there holding your back, A, looking, you, looking for more work for you, but also there is your support network. Is that correct? Yes, they can support you, although uh, you can't really um, bother your agent all the time every day of with course. bombarding b- bombarding them with phone calls like, I'm free, you know. Um, Let's have coffee. Uh, yes, <laughs> take care of me. You know, you are not babies anymore. So they Fair have enough. their lives and they have their jobs and other actors to, to take care of. So... Um, you need also people outside of your professional team because um, this is just your professional life, but you also have to have your personal life and the support system in there, I think, mm. independently from work because unfortunately people change, people quit, people relocate. So things can happen and if you rely yourself too much on one person or that particular person then uh, you can fall apart if that person maybe gets sick or gets a divorce or quits Mm. his job and um, goes to live abroad you know these kind of things that can happen unexpectedly fair enough Awesome. Well, Andrea, thank you. So this has been insightful. It's great to get your thoughts on on both sides of the acting, you know, uh, since you've done the acting journey and the business side as well, which is part of your coaching. Uh, Probably they're both really as important as each other. Before we go, I've got a couple of fast paced questions I like to throw at you at the end, but I wanted to just quickly touch base on your your current projects now that you've you've brought yourself back to Europe. Um, You seem pretty busy still as an actress and a producer. Um, you've just finished a TV series for Amazon, I believe, called uh, Therapy. Is that correct? Yes, it's correct. Uh, it's a six-episode series that's coming out uh, early next year. And where best was that filmed? It was filmed in Germany. It's a German production, right. and it's based on a bestseller novel by Sebastian Fitzek. Awesome, awesome. So for all those actors that are you know, saying, I need to get out of my hometown, or I need to get out of my state, or I need to get to America, that... They don't have to. I mean, we can aspire to be that international actor, but there's there's so much work around. You can choose where you want to work and get, yes, and, and get the jobs. but still, there is a plus in uh, going abroad for an adventure because when you go abroad, um, you, all, you again have a different mindset of yourself. Mm-hmm. And I think it was helpful for me when I went abroad that I needed the job. So this coercive force that I needed to uh, make a living and maintain myself and support myself uh, made me more hungry and made me want to book more. Mm, So if people if people lay back and they don't leave their comfort zones, you know, it's the energy is different sometimes because they don't really need it in terms of like having food on the table. Uh, And that makes perfect sense. Okay, um, before I ask you the the quick questions, um, where can people find you and get some information on your acting career? And obviously, if they're interested in getting coaching from you, what's the best place for them to find you? Thank you. Uh, I have two websites. AndreaOsvard.com is my acting website, but I recently just started uh, my coaching website, AndreaOsvard.coach. And you can book a free um, transformation call with me. It's uh, mm-hmm. complimentary uh, for 45 minutes. And uh, we can have a chat and, um, and see if, we, if uh, I can give you insights. And if you like my insights, then we can decide whether or not it's a good fit for both to work together. Mm-hmm. And um, there is a lot of free resources as well, like my ebook, or that you can download for free from andreasvart.com. Which I've seen already. It's and, awesome. Mm-hmm. And my blog posts post that can be helpful as well. Oh, that's fantastic. And are you on Facebook or Instagram? I am on both. Uh, with Facebook, <laughs> it's a bit all? tricky. <laughs> Facebook is a bit tricky because I'm already over 5,000 friends, so you can't really add me as a friend. And if you message me there, I that um, message probably ends up in a folder that I don't check. 
Fair enough. So it's better to contact me through my website. Awesome. Awesome. And I'll, I'll put all those links into the show notes so people can find them easy anyway. So, yeah, all right. Thank you. A couple of quick questions for you. What is your favorite, what would your favorite t-shirt quote be? If you had a quote and you put it on your shirt, what would you have? Oh, I'm a, such a serious girl. Uh, I would put how you do anything is how you do everything. I like that. That's very nice. I haven't heard that one before. That's awesome. Yeah. That's beautiful. And what do you like most about acting? The passion. It's it's so vivid. It's lively. It's I feel like I'm I'm alive when I act. And I, I agree totally with you. I think um, someone once said to me that once you stop enjoying it, once you stop having fun, then you need to give it up. Yeah. Uh, if you could have if you could have dinner with anyone, living or past, who would it be and why? <laughs> this always um, makes people think. Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe Heath Ledger, if I can say uh, that. I I worked with him. Oh wow! Uh, Are you serious? Yeah, I I worked with him, but uh, the scene I played was so small that it ended up cut out from the uh, movie, unfortunately. But I have photos with him and pictures. But um, he was such an amazing actor, mm. and uh, it's such a loss, I think. It's very rare to that a star is born, a, a talented actor like that is born. So mm. for me, he was he was a big, uh, my favorite actor and a big example. Wow, and and being Australian, uh, most yeah. most of my listeners we all know him. We've got a scholarship um, that they they offer each year, the Heath Ledger Scholarship. So uh, it was a very yeah. tragic loss to the Australian acting community and to the world, I think, because he he was certainly going to bring some amazing characters to life for us, and it's such a shame. Yeah. And um, but that is absolutely wonderful that you had that moment to to meet him. And, and, mm -hmm. and take something away. So that that's fantastic. Uh, finally, Andrea, have I missed anything in this interview that you really want to mention or that we should talk about quickly to wrap things up with? Well, I think you are very prepared and uh, I'm glad that you asked me about the coaching because the, the coaching is also helping not only others, but m myself as well, I like putting together my thoughts and, um, and structuring this program that I am writing for actors. Mm. So whoever's interested, um, I'm honored if you if you reach out and we can have a chat and uh, have this call. And that's I'm awesome. looking forward to connect. And that's what I love about the world we live in now. Uh, COVID's made it even more, brought us all more closer, I think, with Zoom calls and or Riverside FM calls and being able to, to get your training anywhere. I mean, if you look back at your... Um, started your career that you didn't have this ability to just jump on the internet and do a course or to be mentored by someone 10,000 kilometers away. So I think it's wonderful, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is actually. It's our, our, the advantage of this digital world. I love it. Well, thank you again, Andrea. I know you've been a big support of the podcast and it's absolutely fantastic to have you on board. Um, as I said before, my first European guest and my uh, the last guest for season one of 2022. Um, I've, I'm, I've just loved the journey that I've been on and I've had so many wonderful people on board, all with so many insights, the same as you've had today to share. So um, that's why I do the podcast and that's why everyone's listening, I think. So thank you very much for being on board. Good for you. I'm so happy for you that you found this way of um, enjoying yourself and, uh, and make us feel welcome and also that we could contribute to to your show and hopefully to help your listeners thank you and it's a it's a great way to meet people because whether me and you may never have met but i like to say at the end of my podcast and i'd like to say it to you direct perhaps we'll see each other on set sometime soon yes <laughs> that would be wonderful thank, thank you. you very much good to talk to thank you thank you, you.